Welcome to sure. our bureau. Thank to, you. And uh, you are the chairman of one of the most powerful advocacy groups uh, in, in the United States, and we call it Armenian National Committee of America. And non Armenians describe it as the most powerful lobbying group in Washington, one of the most powerful. We call it advocacy group. Yes. And how powerful is ANCA indeed? So, is that the description that you would read in Washington Post, in, in other uh, you know, national newspapers? Is that the case, really? Can you make difference? In White House. I think we can make a difference. I think we have made a difference. Uh, I would leave it to others to describe how powerful we are. The uh, Wall Street Journal describes us as the second most powerful ethnic lobby uh, in the United States. Uh, our influence that comes from our ability to uh, build political capital locally throughout the country. So we are organized with 40 to 50 local Armenian National Committees throughout the country. We have many in California, and Massachusetts, Illinois, Michigan, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey. Where our communities exist, we have local activists. And they build political capital, which hopefully then we harvest wisely in Washington. And our community is well organized. We're focused on issues of importance to us. And uh, we certainly are able to present our, our case and articulate that in Washington. We don't get everything we want. Um, likely nobody does, but we certainly work uh, tirelessly uh, on high tide on issues of concern for our community. So, Mr. Khashkian, as we all know, the most important issue for any Armenian uh, advocacy group is the uh, recognition of the Armenian genocide. And this is also at the top uh, priority for you. And we know that you've been lobbying, you've been advocating this issue and for many, many years, and you had successes, you had failures. So, and is, uh, and what, what we, where we stand now, really. And we know that 100th anniversary is coming and are you sure that there will be a something different this time? Would, will we be able to hear from the White House the word, the word, that every Armenian is waiting for that? Or we will be hearing another invention in linguistic vocabulary how to describe the Armenian genocide? I can't begin to predict uh, what the next president or the current president would have to say with respect to properly characterizing the genocide. Uh, obviously, we're very disappointed in President Obama for having failed to honor his commitment, which yes. he made to our community before he was elected. Uh, in terms of our efforts on, on recognition, the United States has, in many ways, uh, recognized the Armenian genocide, and we continue to pursue that effort because it's so important and, and we want to bring it to the fore of our political agenda. However, we are shifting our focus in terms of the genocide to justice, to reparations, and to uh, bring the American uh, public, to, to, to bring our elected officials to understand that simple acknowledgement of the crime that was committed against our people is insufficient. There must be justice, there must be uh, appropriate compensation for our crimes for our crimes, for the crimes that Turkey committed against uh, our people, against the Armenians. And so uh, we are, among other things, uh, bringing before Congress efforts to call Turkey to return confiscated properties. Uh, and our initial efforts have been uh, along the lines of church properties, which, as you know, encompass not only the churches, but community centers and schools. Yes, and cemeteries and hospitals and so on and so forth. And there are over 2,000 distinct such properties which uh, Ottoman Turkey uh, and, and, and the Republic of Turkey confiscated from our community. And we are calling upon Congress to require through a statute the U.S. government to account for what Turkey has done, to account for annual progress and to report on that uh, each year uh, because in a letter that 
uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton sent us uh, two years ago, she said she believed that confiscated property should be returned. We, of course, uh, uh, agree with her. And uh, we now want to push Turkey. Turkey is attempting to take a face-saving measure by having passed a law that said that properties confiscated since 1936 would be returned. The reality is very few of even those properties have been returned, but 98 percent of the properties were confiscated before 1936, and so uh, it's a false statement on the part of yeah. Turkey that they're taking any substantive action. So the focus of our genocide efforts is shifting to uh, justice uh, as opposed to simply recognition. Are, are we now dealing only with the church property or, or some other things? For example, sometimes you would hear some, you know, uh, Dashnak party members would talk about, you know, return of the Armenian uh, territories and or or the return of Armenians to their homeland. It, and what, can you be more specific on uh, reparation or, or, or sure? Uh, the claims of our people uh, are at several levels. There's the simplest claim, uh, which is somebody's home yeah. or business or a church or a school was taken. Uh, frankly, there, the, um, the records uh, in the various Turkish government uh, offices document that the properties were owned by Armenians mm -hmm. and that they then transferred the title. The Armenians didn't sign over the properties. They weren't sold. They were seized. Yes, they were, yes, they were yes. confiscated. Um, and and uh, Turkish scholars have opined that even the confiscation was not in accordance with law at the time, that, that, that the confiscation was illegal. So at, at, at a first cut, um, we believe all of those properties should be returned. Like on individual basis? You present your documents, you yes. get your property. And, and, and the church, for instance, has extensive documentation yeah. as to the properties that, that should be returned. Secondly, of course, is the lands that belong to our people. Uh, and uh, those encompass uh, a, a large territory. Uh, Woodrow Wilson defined uh, Wilsonian Armenia, uh, which obviously is quite extensive. And uh, we believe that... Um, the lands that belong to Armenians for thousands of years should be returned to we're, Armenians. We're talking about the lands within the Turkish current Turkish government. So we're not talking uh, of changing sovereignty of these uh, lands, right? Uh, uh, the, it remains like within Turkish Republic, but you know, the ownership would, would be changed and Armenians will go back and take their property. Well, in, Is in, that the plan that you're talking in, about? In the first instance, yes. uh, I would say uh, we're simply talking about the, the, the ownership of the properties. Yes, yes. But in the second instance, no, I, I believe that uh, those properties, those lands would mm -hmm. be a better description, belong to the Armenian people. And, and I believe that the sovereignty should go to Armenia. Uh, not to, simply to this Armenia. Yes, to this Armenia. Yeah, I understand that's an ambitious uh, <laughs> undertaking, but nonetheless, uh, Armenians lived there for thousands of years, and uh, these are the fruits of of, of genocidal acts. And uh, Turkey should not benefit from genocidal acts, uh, and so those lands belong to Armenia. Now, the third level uh, is. It simply goes beyond property or, 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 or lands, and, and that's the, the murder, the harm that yeah. was done to our people. And uh, while that's much harder to quantify, obviously, uh, today we have perhaps uh, 10 million Armenians in the world, but only 3 million living in Armenia. Those numbers would be much, much larger. If oh, it, is this number really accurate, you think, more or less, 10 million? I think more or less that's accurate. Yeah. Yeah, um, obviously, it, it depends in part upon how we define it. Um, in my view, somebody who you know, has part Armenian blood yeah, is Armenian. Should we? Uh, and so um, 
this is clearly not a precise measure, but those are reasonable estimates. Uh -huh. um, but the reparations due to the Armenian people uh, are much more extensive than simply the return of the lands. And uh, those can take the form of, of monetary reparations, but they can take other, other forms as well. And, and to me, that's uh, something to be negotiated between the Armenian people and the perpetrator of the crime and the current beneficiary mm -hmm. uh, of the genocidal acts. And, but there is one issue. For example, this reparation that Armenians got from insurance companies, uh, New York Life and AXA Insurance, there's, there's a deal there that, you know, the large part of this uh, payback goes to the organizations in diaspora and as well as church, right? Am I right? Yes. Like uh, more than one third or? The, the portion that's, yeah, uh, the portion. first of all, I wouldn't call that reparations. I would just no, call that just the property that was yeah, owed. Yeah, exactly. Um, because there were policies but that were bought and paid the, for. The, the logic here is that, you know, for some reason, what the, this money should be distributed to the people, not to the organizations. Because I hear this criticism from the insurance owners. From the you know from the people whose fathers and grandfathers owned right. this had insurance policy with these companies and they said instead of distributing this money you know, among us among the people they are just taking these organizations and church they take large portion of this uh, money do you think it's fair or if there is any reparation how would would it be distributed I think again that. Well, well, the Asperger-based organization will get most of it or... Well, or again, let's differentiate. In the case of the insurance policies, to the extent that anybody could show evidence that they were yeah. the descendant of somebody who uh, owned the policy, then it should go to them. Uh, in the instance where... And that's how the settlement was negotiated. But I would point out, this was a private settlement between yeah, exactly. the plaintiffs and the mm -hmm. insurance companies. To the extent that... Um, there aren't claims, then it has to go to True. the people in some fashion. And um, the organizations are simply a proxy yeah. for the people. And uh, whether those organizations are in Armenia or whether they're in the diaspora, I think that uh, both are appropriate. But that recipients. money is being used again for the people, right? It should, it should go to the people. And frankly, in my view, it should benefit uh, the Armenian nation, whether it be Mm -hmm. uh, the country of Armenia or whether it be the diaspora. Now, there's another issue. To be successful in the States, in America, these, we have also other advocacy groups or lobbying groups, and, but we hear more and more that there's uh, you know, conflict between all, uh, you know, our, our organizations in, in the States. Sometimes we hear that, for example, there, there, there's you're not cooperating fully or they are not cooperating fully with you. I'm talking about Armenian Assembly of America and some other groups as well. And, and there that, you know, Armenians would criticize you, not you only, but also Armenian Assembly, that you are not united in fighting for the Armenian cause, for the Armenian issues. And that's why you are not successful. Is that I don't think fair that's criticism or not. I think it's a fair issue to raise. I don't think it's a fair criticism. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's reasonable the community to to expect that advocacy organizations would work together to the extent that they can. We have always worked as cooperatively as we can with any Armenian advocacy organization. Yeah. Um, and I would say, on balance, that's been uh, the reality of what has occurred. Yeah. On the few cases where we haven't been. Uh, in agreement, you know, we will pursue uh, each of our own agendas. Uh, I think that um, history has shown that the positions that the Armenian National Committee has taken have enjoyed the popular support of the community. Uh, you know, I would cite, for instance, the opposition to Richard Hoagland being appointed yeah. uh, ambassador to uh, Armenia. The Armenian Assembly supported his nomination, the ANC yes. opposed it. 
uh, I would say in terms of the Armenia-Turkish protocols, again, the Assembly supported it and, and the ANCA opposed it. Having said that, while people remember the differences, the reality is uh, in terms of our broad agenda, in terms of genocide recognition and, and justice and reparations, in terms of the economic well-being of Armenia, in terms of uh, a free and independent uh, Karabakh determined on the basis yeah. of self-determination. Uh, the advocacy groups are, are certainly Together. in agreement. Yeah. And uh, I, I do believe that uh, our efforts in Washington are not at all hindered by any differences that we may have. Uh, we don't, you know, we try very hard not to take those differences public in Washington or in any of the capitals that we might work because that, I would agree, is not advantageous to us. Mm -hmm. uh, and we try to keep those differences within our community. Uh, and the reality is we do work together. But how about this genocide museum that, you know, we know that Armenian Assembly and Kafeshchan uh, uh, bought this property now, former uh, central uh, Central it, Bank? It was a bank. It was uh, a bank, it, right? It, it, and, in, in Washington. But it's still not functional, right? right? Because they're fighting in the court for the ownership. I don't know what's what's happening there. We, we have that property. It's a huge property. It's a great location. Yes. And it could be really one of the national treasures. And why don't you just go together and, you know, solve this issue? Is well, that so? The, the NCA is not party to that dispute. I know, but, you know, yeah. you can help, you know, to solve uh, this I, dispute, I, I right? I would uh, be happy to attempt to mediate it, but yeah. other people have attempted to mediate it without success. Um, the courts uh, are in the process of adjudicating, unfortunately, because it's taken many, many years. And uh, right now the courts have spoken and said that the Confession Family Foundation is the rightful owner of the property, and uh, the Assembly is appealing that decision. I believe the appellate process will be over soon, and the courts will speak. And now we know Gafeshchan passed Gafeshchan away. Gafeshchan, very sadly, what has will passed happen away. To that, uh, I honestly don't know. Uh, property. It, it, it's up to his estate. Yeah, uh, to uh, I don't know the terms of his will and his estate as to what. Will it serve its purpose, it, even if they get this, uh, you know, property back? I hope it does. Do you think it will remain as a genocide museum or not? It, it's hard to speculate as to yeah. what his estate uh, is. Uh, having known Mr. Kafeshchin, I suspect that he has given he direction that it, that it in fact be built. Mm -hmm. uh, but time will tell soon enough. Will, will you support that to happen? You know? uh, we think that uh, a genocide museum in Washington would be uh, a very worthy project. Yes. And it's one that the whole community sh should support. And let's turn to the domestic issues here in Armenia. And we can hear some Armenian, even politicians, openly uh, criticizing not only you, but other advocacy groups as well, that you're just busy with uh, genocide recognition and some other stuff, but you're never uh, keenly interested in what, what's happening in the country. Uh, the fate of these people is not really one of those issues that, you know, could be considered as uh, one of the top issues of your agenda. Uh, how would you respond to this? Oh, I, I we, we really, we never hear anything, any substantial statement or criticism uh, the, the, the actions of the current or previous government. So. In fact, very high in our agenda is what I describe as the economic well-being of Armenia. If Armenia isn't a prosperous, well-functioning state, yes. uh, if there isn't uh, solid incomes, if there isn't good employment, uh, people won't stay, and there isn't a country. So you can pursue whatever you want in the way of ad advocacy, but it's a wasted effort if we don't have an Armenia yes, uh, for our, yeah. our, our people to live in. So uh, I would say to those who criticize our efforts to in fact look at our record. We supported Armenia's accession into the WTO, World Trade Organization, mm -hmm. and that required action by the U.S. Congress, which we yes. strongly supported. 
to change certain statutes to allow uh, Armenia's entry. Uh, we have been a strong advocate of a free trade agreement uh, between Armenia and the United States, and uh, we believe that the strength of the Armenian economy is critical. Uh, the problems that exist in this country of concentration of wealth, of corruption, um, of high unemployment, all of which in turn lead to uh, out-migration are... Artagacht, as we call it. Absolutely, are, are just terrible. And uh, it's important that those be addressed. It's important that uh, the government uh, change its ways uh, and to stop from giving lip service to these issues, which is what has been the case, uh, and to substantively uh, deal with it. Uh, Armenia ranks very poorly on any measure of corruption. Uh, Armenia obviously ranks very poorly on unemployment. And, and you know, people are voting with economic need if they can't earn a living, if they exactly. can't support a family, uh, they're leaving. And uh, all too often, the young and the brightest uh, are motivated to lead, leave yeah. for the same reason. And we can't allow that to happen. So uh, I would say that um, this issue, the economic well-being of Armenia, is a very important issue on our advocacy agenda. We do what we can in the United States to uh, help the economy by improving economic relationships with the United States. By but are you trying to influence aid. the Armenian government, for example, to change its uh, you know behavior in in terms of uh, to be more open in terms of our, building democracy? Our advocacy efforts in Washington are, 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 is not to lobby the Armenian government. That's that's not our role. Yes. it's the role of the political parties here in this country and uh, of, of the people here. But we know that you have affiliation with one of the parties here, right? The Dashnak party and Dashnak too, which is now in opposition to the Armenian yes. government. Um, I think they have to be like uh, actually the ones who will do the job for you. Yeah, I, I think that um, the opposite, I would certainly encourage the opposition parties in this country to be aggressive in pushing the government to change its ways. Uh, I don't believe that the government has pursued the right policies. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe that, and, and I, I believe that the results speak for themselves. I, yes. I, I don't know how one could argue that they have yeah. followed the right policies. It's, it's self-evident that they haven't. They haven't succeeded. Uh, yeah. Even if they want to argue that they're following the right policies, they, ha they have failed. Uh, and so, uh, we believe it's very important that change occurs. We believe it's very important that um, the opposition in this country uh, raise its voice and uh, educate the public as to the need for a change in these policies. Uh, yeah. And it's critically important for the long-term success of Armenia. Now let's uh, talk about the very important critical issue for Armenia. It seems to me that there, there's a big shift here and that could also impact our sovereignty here. Um, well, the Armenian government has decided to join the customs union, Moscow-led you know, right. grouping, which is still, uh, you know, it considered to be like economic union, but if you read the, not the constitution, but the regulations, you will see that it's like mm, supranational, you know, body that overwrites every national uh, constitution, which could be, you know, in a way become like a, the killing of <laughs> sovereignty in Armenia. And we know that Armenian National Committee is really behind the Armenian sovereignty. How would you evaluate, instead, so Armenia shifts its foreign policy by joining Moscow led this union and turned its uh, and actually canceled all the efforts that the European Union has put to, you know, to get Armenia to its markets, to its, you know, uh, and to, to reform Armenia, in fact. What, how would you read this situation? How would you evaluate it? The reality is that Armenia has followed a foreign policy that's attempted to walk a fine line between both yes. Russia and, and the West. 
uh, and I think that foreign policy makes sense. Yeah. Um, Armenia obviously uh, has important uh, security interests that, that Russia provides. Um, neither the EU nor the United States, unfortunately, provides that. And that's critically important to Armenia. At the same time, uh, its own sovereignty, I would argue, is something that Armenia should never give up to either the Customs Union or to the EU. Yes. Uh, Armenia should uh, stand on its own. We haven't fought the fight that we're fighting. Our ancestors haven't died in a genocide uh, for us to simply roll over and hand the keys of the country over to anybody. Uh, I'm not saying that's what the government has done. Um, time will tell as to what the Customs Union will evolve to. Um, I still think it's important for Armenia to maintain strong economic and political relations with both the East and the West. Um, and uh, I would also urge the government to be transparent uh, in its process of arriving at these decisions. Uh, I think whether one agrees with the decision or not, uh, and as I said, I understand why the government made the decision that it made. Uh, however, one can be fairly critical of the government for the way at which it arrived at the decision. You know, after four years of negotiating with the EU to suddenly turn on a dime, uh, I don't think it was fair to the EU. I don't think it's fair to the Armenian people. Uh, the government knew what it was going to do, I would argue, um, unless, in fact, there were increased pressure from Russia. And I think if that's the case, then the government should explain that should uh, be open about they deny what, what they occurred. deny flatly and, and, that and, there and, was a pressure and given which is hard yes. to believe yes. uh, <laughs> but 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 whatever that context they should be transparent about it i exactly. I, I don't know what occurred uh, but whatever it was it shouldn't be behind closed and doors it was sort of like huge disappointment for the europeans because yes. they were negotiating with armenian government for three and a half years. Absolutely. And they issued almost joint statement that we successfully uh, uh, concluded negotiations and we welcome Armenia uh, with this successful right. end. And after that, suddenly I talked to Stefan Fiule, who is EU Commissioner on Enlargement, and he said that, you know, he had no prior knowledge that this is coming. Clearly, uh, Armenia changed direction very quickly uh, and this is where again I think it's fair to be critical of the government for Armenia not having signaled to the EU that it was having a change of, of, of its mind or that it was under pressure uh, and I would encourage Armenia to still look at um, strengthening economic ties with the EU and with the United States and the rest of the Western world because I don't think being in one camp or the other is good for the country yes. long term and certainly sovereignty can't be uh, given away. Nobody argues here in Armenia that Armenia should have really close relations with Russia including military and political right. but joining the customs union that has Kazakhstan you know and soon there will be Kyrgyzstan and I don't know Vietnam is rather questionable and Belarus which is considered to be one of the dictatorships in Europe so and therefore it's uh, it's people are still you know struggling with i understand <laughs> those reservations yeah and, and we don't know all the details yet so we can't make a a judgment but as i said in my view it's important for armenia to yes. maintain ties with both and sides Mr. Khashkian, we know that you're meeting uh, you have a lot of meetings with the different government agencies officials uh, if it's not secret, what, what have you been discussing with them? Is there any specific message that you are getting to them or they are getting to you? The Ministry of Diaspora has organized uh, what I'll call consultative meetings yes. uh, for various uh, diasporans who have been uh, invited here with uh, high levels of, of, of the government. Uh, we met yesterday with the Minister of Defense. Mm -hmm. We're meeting tomorrow with the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, mm -hmm. We're meeting with the President's office this afternoon. Yes. Uh, we met with the, the, the um, Chair of the Constitutional Court this morning. Uh, 
in each case, they're explaining to uh, diasporan Armenians the issues of concern that they have, and diasporans are in turn explaining issues of concern that they have, and I believe it's a productive exchange. Uh, These issues are being also discussed there? Yes, issues of, of uh, we haven't had any active discussion of the Customs Union, yes. but we have discussed, and we will be, for instance, this afternoon, uh, we're meeting with the... Um, Vigan Sarkisian. Uh, yeah. Well, we're meeting with Vigan Sarkisian, but we're also meeting with the president of, of Karabakh. Uh-huh. Bakosag. Uh -huh. Yes. And, um, and, and so, really, uh, all of the critical issues to the future of uh, uh, Armenia and Karabakh are, are being discussed. And I think it's a very healthy, product productive exchange. And speaking of Karabakh, we know that Russia uh, sold some, you know, some tanks, quite <laughs> very, very advanced weaponry. Uh, it's like T-90. It's very advanced you know, um, machinery, military equipment, and it, these are really advanced weapons. And, and the deal is really big. It valued almost one billion, over one billion dollars. Have you been communicating your concerns to the Russians, or do you have any channels that you can talk to them? Or uh, It's not our place in terms of yes. the Armenian National Committee of America yeah. to convey our concerns. However, uh, I know that uh, our colleagues uh, in the Soviet Union uh, in Moscow, in Moscow are, are conveying their, yeah. their concerns. And I know that you know, Armenians here are conveying their concerns. Uh, the Karabakh officials uh, assure us that they feel comfortable in terms of their ability to defend the country. Um, but clearly, large weapon sales to Azerbaijan are concerning. They should be concerning to any Ar Armenian, you know, whether they're sold by Russia or some China or anybody. Uh, there would be fair concern expressed over that. Any time an enemy uh, is overarmed, it's of concern. Uh, the recent statement by uh, President Aliyev that uh, soon enough uh, we'll the Azeris conquer. will occupy Yerevan is extremely troubling and reflective of his mindset. And in fact, just uh, yesterday, uh, we sent a letter over my signature to President Obama mm -hmm. asking him to condemn these most recent remarks uh, by President yeah, Aliyev. Do you believe he will do that? Yeah. Uh, I certainly hope that he will because the statements that uh, President Aliyev made are uh, anathema and, and very distasteful. I'm meeting tomorrow morning with the U.S. Ambassador to Armenia, okay. John Heffern, to again convey our concerns and to ask the United States government to express to Azerbaijan their uh, strong disagreement and condemnation of these remarks. So it certainly would be my expectation that they would do so. Thank you very much, Mr. Khajikian, My pleasure. for coming Thank to you. our studio. Thank you for sharing your precious time. We know that you're very, very busy here. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.